Welcome back to the Sydney Reactor. Thanks for sticking around with us for the Build Digital live stream today. And I found that really fascinating couple of sessions that we had from Justin and his various guests. As someone who speaks Australian, and that's about it, uh, the idea of localizing content is something that I too often forget. So it's great to hear about the work that we're doing to make it easier for people to produce localized content, whether it's on the documentation website for an open source project or for your company's uh, like business documentation and stuff like that. It's always really important to think about how you can make it right for the audience. And it's also a great segue for the next two guests that have coming up. They're going to tell us a bit about how they've gone in terms of doing online content and production of online content. And it's and if you want to learn more uh, about how we do it, you can head over to Microsoft Learning right now and check out that stream. But I'd like to hope that you're going to stick around and listen from Lars and Narita, who are going to be joining me today. Narita, how about you introduce yourself and what you've been doing on this space recently? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Narendra Vichasono. I'm the CEO of Decoding.com. Uh, we are an online education startup that was established five years ago. Uh, our vision is to nurture a winning network of developers, and our mission is to supply the IT industry with the best developer talent in the market. Uh, our graduates now working at various startups, including Unicorn. Yeah, I think that's all. Cool. And Lars, how about yourself? Hello, hello. Thanks for having me, Aaron. Uh, I'm Lars Clint. I'm a Microsoft MVP. I've been doing online learning for a long time. I've been teaching for about seven years or something, uh, about as almost as long as I've been an MVP. And um, it's just part of my my fabric, I think. Um, I really enjoy it. So um, I am uh, coming to you here from, from uh, rural Australia. So uh, if there are pixels on your screen, that's just my satellite connection. Excellent. And I suppose that's a great way to, um, to start our first segue around online learning is that you can do this from absolutely anywhere you are in the world, whether you're in a very remote part of Australia or whether you're in another country where we're having a conversation like we are with Narita. Uh, but I'll throw out probably the first question, which I think will be the easiest one to answer because it's always good to start there. And ask you, both of you, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges that you've got when producing online content? Lars, why don't I start with you? Sure. Um, for me, it's it's knowing who my audience is. Um, because if you're in a classroom, you can kind of gauge who your students are. You get a, a sense of people talking back to you and asking questions, that sort of thing. If you're in an online form, and especially if it's one way, such as video, um, you need to know who your audience is. And that, to me, is is number one. If I don't know who my audience is, how, how do I know what I'm teaching? How, how do I know who I'm talking to? So that's probably the, the main thing for me in an online forum. And what about you, Anirita? Any thoughts around um, some of the biggest challenges that you've experienced when producing online content? Yeah, I think uh, uh, there is three challenges, in my opinion. Uh, first is about uh, creating structured content that is tailored with each student's ability. This means that beginner level students will looking for an easy to follow entry point, while advanced students will be looking for attain high level achievement for a course. Second is a storytelling, communicating through stories to enable students in better comprehending the objective of particular subject. And the third one is accommodating different type of learner. For example, expert developer always excited with updated content. So if we producing like a curriculum in informational and information and technology, that's going to be challenging because the content will need, uh, need always to be updated. You make a really good point there about storytelling being a key aspect in making compelling online learning. I was thinking back to the keynote with Scott Hanselman earlier today uh, that we had an on-call for, or if you dialed in really early, uh, so the, the live one at about 3 a.m. Australian time. And the way that he kind of crafted that narrative around having a, like a team's call and then just dialing in different people to ask them different things, I think that made it feel less like I was watching someone else just read through a script and instead it was very engaging. So uh, extending on that, like, what are some other things that you found really valuable when it comes to producing engaging online content? Because what I've experienced is that people, well, they want to do their own thing and they, they're kind of like, well, the video could be playing, maybe I'll just have a nap on the couch while that's happening. So how do we go about engaging with those people that are wanting to, uh, that we're wanting to educate? 
Um, I'll, I'll, I'll throw that question over. <laughs> yeah, I'll throw that. Sorry. I forgot that I should probably actually throw that to a particular person. I think we're all learning in this new online environment. Um, so, Narita, um, given it's a point that you brought up, why don't we start with you? Like, what are your thoughts around the best way to make content really engaging for our audience? Okay. So, uh, any students of distance learning will, will, will deal with a lot of distraction because they are not disciplined in a, like learning or school environment. So every individual will have different golden time when they can focus. So online learning need to accommodate more of asynchronous form of education where the students and tutor do not always need to meet online at the same time. Particularly when students spread through different time zones, syn synchronous uh, or real-time learning becomes more challenging. Every student has a different learning pace. Many online students have full-time job and cannot allocate the majority of their time to study. Deadlines are important and the platform need to give guidance or display indicators that show student progress in order to motivate them. And uh, next, the students of all different backgrounds can join online learning. Based on my experience, we have students ranging from motorcycle taxi drivers to CEO of a company. Therefore, there is a need of flexibility in terms of choosing which level they want to start or skip from. I think this is one of the biggest difference with in-person education where you need to always follow what the tutor uh, gives to you, right? In online learning, we need to give a flexibility so students can skip module, but they cannot skip the compliance check. Uh, and then mentors need to be readily available to help students if they have question or get stuck on particular problem. I, I'm going to share you one of our secret ingredients that we empower our top graduates to become mentor in our platform. So it become a robust network of developers helping other developers. And last one, I think the most essential element to ensure engagement in online learning is through assignment submission. Uh, we have responsibility to measure students' ability by validating their understanding through quiz, exams, and project submission. For example, in our platform, we do manual code review. So all students must submit their codes, which are then reviewed by a team of an expert. So I think, yeah, that's uh, based on uh, experience where decoding is an online education platform that focusing on developer segment. Cool, and I've had the pleasure of being in a number of your talks and workshops over the years, Lars. And you're a very dynamic presenter. You, you like, you've like you got that really good energy that helps bring people in and, and keep them focused. How do you find translating that into an online learning environment where you, know, you can't see the audience or you can't get that real-time feedback? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you're absolutely right. I do thrive on the energy, especially of my spectators. So if you do an, an online event, you know, what is the, the kind of energy that comes back is really important in the way that I teach and the way that I present. So moving to an online format, I haven't done that for many years now, though it's, it is part of sort of what I do as well. And I like my approach has always been, OK, I'm just going to throw people off a little bit, because if you keep doing the bullet point, bullet point, bullet point slide kind of PowerPoint of death, then you're going to lose people. It might take you two minutes, it might take you five minutes, but you'll lose them. So my approach has been, okay, I'm going to throw something in here that they didn't expect. So it could be, for example, I've explained uh, IoT using Lego cars. Um, I've in, you know, explained a database using, using a, an IKEA bookshelf, but in the middle of some lecture. So suddenly it switches to that. Um, so that's one method I've certainly used. That works really well if there are people that are new to technology, I find. If you have more experienced learners, they just want to get to the nitty gritty. They want to, they don't want all the fluff at the start and the end. Just show me the thing. Just show me how to do the thing. So again, it depends on what your audience is and who you are teaching to. Um, and it doesn't, that doesn't change whether it's in a classroom or online. What does change is the method that you use in those cases. So again, know your audience and then understand that the online uh, medium loses people really quick. We've seen this with ads as well. To ads are 10, 15 seconds because people just get lost otherwise. So you need to capture people really quickly online. That's probably the key ingredients, I think, that I found. 
Yeah, and it's interesting that both of you have brought up this notion of having to know who your audience is, whether they're someone that's working full time and doing some additional education on the side, whether they're in an alternative industry and looking to do a cross skill across into technology and things like that, or whether you're just trying to make sure that you understand who is going to be watching your streams or reading your content and things like that to make sure that when you're putting it together, it is speaking to them. You know, you're not putting together really beginner content if you know that the people that are going to be watching it and consuming it are people that are looking for that advanced level content and, and really wanting to dig deep into how something works technically. Now, we've seen mm -hmm. over the, particularly, I guess, over the last couple of months as we've seen lockdowns and, and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic go around the globe and people changing the way that they work uh, and having to work more remotely, starting to look more at um, non-traditional or what I consider a non-traditional education platforms, such as Twitch and Mixer and other online streaming uh, areas. Uh, as people that have been producing content for a while and doing that digitally, do you see that, well, I guess I'll rephrase that question, where do you see these sorts of uh, platforms fitting into what you're trying to do as online educators? Do they supplement? Are they for a different market? Or do you have any other thoughts around how these streaming services work compared to more asynchronous education? Uh, I'll throw this one to, to Lars uh, to first up, just to put him under the spotlight. Sure, no problem. Um, I think we still haven't quite understood. We haven't quite reached the peak of what we can do with online learning. Still, there's, there's a long way to go. So these new platforms are just new tools that we can use. Um, I did my first Twitch stream last week. And I didn't know what to expect. And as a side note, something like live coding scares the hell out of me. Um, it's just not my thing, right? So I'm sort of been a little bit hesitant. But now having used it, I sort of like, oh, this is a great, in my case, supplementary tool. I could um, say do the course that I do online and have, hey, once a week there's a live Q&A for 45 minutes using Twitch. That could absolutely be a thing that people can then study towards that you know, that, that weekly end goal and then ask questions if there's something they didn't understand. So that's a one example that I can just come up with that where it really fits in. Um, I also believe that there could be full on live classes um, using those kind of streaming services. Um, I don't think the technology is quite there yet to, especially in terms of collaboration, all of us talking together, but I think it'll get there. I, I think it's a tool that we just have to accept and use, like take the most advantage of it that we can. And uh, Narita, we were talking uh, the other day about this and um, you had some, some perspectives on what you think the role of streaming um, services can have when it comes to doing online learning. Do you want to share them uh, with everyone that's watching in today? Yeah, yeah. I think in my personal opinion, streaming platform like Twitch will become a popular learning tool in the global market because it can accommodate real-time online streaming to the large audience. But in a market like where I live, Indonesia, uh, the internet speed still a challenge. Real-time streaming may not be the most effective solution yet for massive online education. Uh, even like uh, the government now like using like uh, traditional TV to deliver the online learning to uh, uh, junior uh, to, to elementary school. So I think as the asynchronous learning model with offline playback still offer the best solution for the time being. Yeah, actually, that's a really good point. And uh, I suppose Lars is probably sitting there when we're talking about you know, poor internet speeds. He's like, there's, there's literally a satellite dish that I have to connect to. And uh, it's it's actually probably a better speed than I get at home because um, uh, in rural Australia, you can somehow get that better than I get here in uh, suburban city, Sydney. Um, but it, it is very valid a point that you've got to think about again, the audience that you're communicating with. If you are targeting someone uh, that is in a, like a globally diverse um, organization, maybe the ability to deliver content, you need to think about, well, can it be done asynchronously as well as synchronously because they might be somewhere where they don't have as strong an internet connection or they are, it's an incompatible time for them or something like that. Um, I, I definitely know that I've experienced that when trying to do some of the online stuff myself is that yeah, you, you got to think about, well, you know, who's watching this? Where are they coming from? And are they going to be able to watch it in real time like me? I guess that, that's another thing that we can throw back to the, the previous session about localizing content. It's thinking globally about what we're producing and not just thinking about the people we know or the people that we expect to target in the way that we communicate. And I want to talk a bit about how tooling can be used to support what we're doing with online learning. 
Uh, earlier today, I had a chance to chat about uh, VS Code Spaces, which is an online platform for uh, essentially hosting a development environment. And then we've got a companion product in, uh, Visual, Studio, in Visual Studio and VS Code called LiveShare, which you can share out an environment or sorry, a connection to an environment that someone can connect via a browser, via their developer tools, and be collaboratively involved in the editing or um, development of a project. Now, uh, so you made the point there, Lars, around uh, it, it can be a little bit challenging when we think about how we can do collaboration. Have you had an opportunity to, to try out any of those sorts of tools and see how they can fit into the way that you know, either you're working with your peers or you're working um, with potential students? So I've used um, I used Code Spaces back uh, sometime after Ignite like, when it was called Visual Studio Online, um, and yes, definitely I, I think there's merit in that. I like the story that Nick, Nick Molnar gave me at the time of him live coding with his manager who happened to be on a plane and they were live coding, right? So those sort of scenarios, yes, they don't happen very often, but that kind of highlights the way that we can collaborate on these things. Um, I'm also thinking in terms of how do I collaborate? How do I get students together um, that may not know each other? That's the collaboration angle that I would really like to see as well, that the, some of the tooling could facilitate saying, hey, I got this problem. Hey, I got this solution. Maybe we can put those two together. And and those, I don't think we're quite there yet with those kind of tooling sets. Um, but something like Live, Live Share or Coding Spaces is absolutely a way that we can um, at least facilitate some sort of interaction with the coding. Um, we have um, at my company also created um, sandboxes for cloud computing. So we have, you know, students can spit up a live instance of a cloud, um, you know, a VM or whatever service they're, they're learning at, and it'll just work. Like with the click of a button, they have a full scenario where they can learn. So those sort of toolings are important when we want to um, remove the barriers of, of how you get into whatever it is, the topic that you're trying to learn. Um, so yes, Live, live uh, code spaces, or you know, live sharing of code, or live sandboxes, whatever it might be. Those tools have to be there in order for the students to not first have the hurdle of, oh, I need to set everything up first, um, because then we lose them. Yeah, for sure. And again, that was something that we were talking about with uh, David earlier on the on that stream. Is how do you make something that, as a student, you can easily jump in and connect with and get up and running fast? Because if you try and have something that is overly complex and it's like, well, first you've got to then run this script and then you've got to install that piece of software and people are going to go, that's great, but I would like to not have to spend the first three days of my class setting up a development box. I would like to just you know, get in and do my learning. Is that, that can be a real mm -hmm. challenge and a I guess a barrier to entry to get people on board and engaged. Uh, and I uh, like the idea that you were talking about there of, uh, that you can set up these sandboxed environments for people to use when doing it. I know that we do a very similar thing with uh, the MS Learn platform. And if you're going through those sorts of uh, modules on there, you can spin up an environment to play with an Azure VM or uh, run with containers yep. and stuff like that. I, I found it quite useful because you know, it can get very daunting if you're trying to learn something new and there's a myriad of options you got to click through and someone is able to, to guide you through in a, like, a contained environment so you don't accidentally spin up the wrong sorts of resources that can help. And that can also uh, help go down the way of creating a very structured learning path. It was something that you brought up, uh, Narita, around trying to create a structured learning path so that you know, students don't feel like overwhelmed and distracted about where they might go. Uh, has that been your experience as well, that you the, the structure is really to make sure that people know where their end goal is and what they're trying to achieve, rather than here's a pile of documentation, start reading, we'll see you at the end? Yeah, I think uh, we need to give like uh, we in, in online learning we cannot give uh, directly like the example because if we give like uh, just one example, uh, students tend to just follow that. We need to give a lot of perspective and a lot of sample. Then people will will just uh, will see like which option that will suit with uh, their requirement. So I, I also want to share you that uh, based on like previous. Uh, based on my experience that we, we have a code review a session with students and uh, the mentor will give like inline feedback, uh, inline code review, and that's really helpful for, for many students. Yeah, I guess. Cool. Um, and 
I, as, as I think we evolve into this idea of doing online learning and um, sort of moving to this new way of working, I'm back, the back of my mind still. I still miss engaging with people one to one. I like you know running a workshop and actually being able to see that reaction from students, and uh, I like going to events and, and talking to people in person and not just uh, at the other end of a video call. And you, know, you mentioned earlier, Lars, that you like to know your audience and you really feed off their energy to help you present in a way that's going to be um, best for that audience. Do you think that once we get back to um, a semblance of normality and we're no longer being locked down in our houses every single day, that we will see a rise back into in-person education? Or do you think that this model of doing things online is really where we're going to stay and, and what people are now going to want to consume through? You're asking me, right? Um, yeah. I'm not and, sure and, the and world look, is ready to really leave this farm yet. Just, but, um, <laughs> Um, I, I definitely think we're going to go back to in-person training. Like we are humans, we are social beings. We thrive of you know the human contact. Um, that doesn't mean we have to go and breathe on each other, but we definitely will have to to do have that social interaction again. Yes, online format is great. It, it can work really well. Um, events like MS Build is a definite example of something that it runs really smoothly. Um, at least when you see it from this side, maybe not behind the scenes, I don't know, but at least the experience as, a, as an attendee is really good. Does it replace going to an event and having the physical space? I don't think so. Um, it's, it's not the same event. It's not the same experience. Um, the knowledge is there and the knowledge sharing that we get from all these um, sessions that we're attending, but we're still missing that tactile or, you know, you know, we're missing the smell of the event, for for lack of a better term. Um, and I think it'll be the same with online training. So I, I do online training for a living. That's not going to go away. This is what I do, and I'm very, very happy that I do this. But part of my being is also being in front of people and being next to people. And I don't think that'll change. The way we do it may change somewhat, but I don't think it'll change. And Narita, um, do you do much in-person training as well as the online stuff um, through your organisation? And if so, do you think that you'll see a bit more of a transition back once um, people are uh, able to leave their houses? Yeah, we occasionally also do the offline session as well. I think uh, there is a huge difference where we can really see the feedback directly. But for time being, I think what I try to say to my team is now we try to gather the feedback as much as possible in a synchronous way means that if we see the feedback from students from their LinkedIn or social media or comments or whatever channel, I, we, we try to compile that and make the uh, compilation or summary of that to make the trainer become happier. You know, <laughs> like sometimes trainer need uh, like excitement level from student where it can energize back the trainer, right? So this is how we we, we we solve that problem for the time being. For sure. And I don't think anyone wants to, to you know, kind of jump in too quickly into you know, getting back in situations where we're all like huddled together in a room and then all of a sudden we've got a, like a new outbreak of a, of a virus or anything like that. I think a lot of people are very comfortable in this as an approach to education. It's just as, as primary educators yourself, I, I was interested to see your, your thoughts around that and how we are likely to, to take our learnings that we've had in this period where we've had to be a lot more restrictive about going out and the way that we produce content has changed and then be able to pivot back once uh, we, we talk about normality or whatever that's going to look like in the future. Um, and and another th uh, something else that I just wanted to, to touch on, um, and this uh, gets a bit of information to the audience, is that uh, we've been working behind the scenes at Microsoft to produce an, another way of consuming online content. Today with our guests here, I've talked a bit about how we can go out there and we can use like streaming platforms and discovering content and all that sort of stuff. We've put together a new service from Microsoft called Learn TV uh, that will allow you to kind of collaborate with a whole, sorry, uh, collate a whole lot of different um, content options and be able to, to consume them as um, consumption points in addition to all the other ways uh, to find content out there. Because there's, there's a million and one different places where content's getting published and being able to know where a single centralized point is that you can come watch stuff, I, I think that's a, a good initiative. And as companies move towards that of and not just you know, content that's thrown up on YouTube and it's like, oh, yeah, maybe it's over there or it's over here, I think it's a good idea to, to look at the way of, uh, we can do centralization. Um, in terms of actually being a producer of content, 
Um, what are some of the tips that you might have for people that might be looking to get into it themselves? Uh, whether it's you know, the setup, I can see that you in the background there, Lars, have a whole green screen and camera and I'm like, why Why isn't he using any of that? Is Or is that actually a virtual background and you just wanted to, to hide the mess that's uh, the office that you're presenting from? No, I'm sitting in, there's actually 12 llamas around me. No, um, I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to all this equipment. I um, I'm learning. Uh, I didn't used to do, especially not live streaming. I, I, you know, I'm on a satellite connection. What would I do? But I'm learning, and and part of that learning curve is okay. How do I get good audio? Um, that is number one for me. That is number one tip if you want to do online anything. Make sure your audio is good because yes, the picture can be pixelated, and your screen share might suddenly stall or freeze, whatever. If people can't hear you, they're gonna disappear. Um, and get yeah. So I am using this lapel mic here. You can also have a boom mic. You can have a you know another podcast mic like I have behind me here. Um, there's many many different ways you can get good audio. But I would definitely invest uh, time and probably some money in getting good audio. Um, that to me is that's number one. Cool. And and Rita, uh, do you have any tips to uh, people that might be thinking about getting into online content production and how to like make the most out of the space that they've got to do that? Yeah, I think the first one is uh, you need to have a proper environment in 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 your in your setup. So of course you need to have a comfortable table, chair. Audio of course is mandatory, but we also need a proper camera. Uh, I'm not really kind of nerd <laughs> uh, to buy like the most expensive one. For me, it's just uh, as long as I can get the uh, the the good uh, microphone, good camera, and good lighting. That should be uh, enough for me. Yeah, I can definitely attest to having yeah, good lighting. I'll, you can see all the. Oh, yeah, sorry. Lars. I'll add one if I can. <laughs> I'm just rude interrupting you. Um, so all that's great. The tips with the equipment and the lighting and the cameras and, and that is important. Um, make sure you have something interesting to say as well. <laughs> just putting it out there. Make sure that whatever it is that you're presenting actually has some value. Uh, I've seen too many live streams of someone just sort of going, "Oh, I'll just have a go," and it's really confusing and messy and you know around. That doesn't mean it has to be perfect. You know, everybody should definitely have a go, but just have some thought put into what you're presenting. Because remember, you have an audience. First impressions are important. Um, so if you have good lighting, good audio, good video, that's great. But you need to have a good narrative as well. Uh, and yeah, things may blow up and go wrong, but then you go from there. At least you had a plan. So that was my other tip. Oh, uh, so. You just triggered on something that I wanted to talk about in the last couple of minutes that we're here, is when things go wrong. Uh, when we're presenting, you know, if we're on a stage at a conference or something like that, and our demo falls over, or um, I was presenting earlier this year at Ignite Sydney, and the entire power went out in the room. So I ended up with like no, no projector or anything like that. Uh, Obviously, producing online content is a little bit different because you're in a more controlled environment. But how do you deal with the potential failures that you might have when you're presenting or producing online content? Um, so I'll start with you, Narita. Yeah, I think the first one is uh, for me, where you know the power is sometime outage, the internet sometime drop. First, for me, is giving the expectation to audience. So that's very important. So we 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 forgive in the beginning that okay, this is the, we try our best that we can, but if something failure, you just need to wait for a couple of seconds. So yeah, that's like I think last will will have more comprehensive of that. And I think I've been in uh, a talk of yours when uh, you've not gone quite as smoothly as you had of hoped, Lars. Um, like, how do you do the the fallbacks um, like when you're producing your online content, or is it just We'll pick it, pick it up in post. What do you mean just one talk? <laughs> I think that's a common occurrence, <laughs> isn't it? Because I am I, I am a bit sort of impulsive and go, oh, let's try that, and then things blow up. But that's a different story. Um, in terms of online content, one of the things I've learned over the years is that you can make things too polished um, to the point where it seems artificial and almost kind of plasticky. Um, if you inject yourself into it, which means leaving in your mistakes at times, Yes, you can edit those mistakes as well, um, but leave some of the mistakes in and show how you solve it is super, super important for, for learners um, because if they only see the golden path every time, when things go wrong, what do they do? Um, so 
don't be afraid of, of failure. Uh, don't be afraid of, of having things blow up. It's fine. It happens all the time in, you know, in every event. That's just part of it. Just make sure that you are prepared for it to happen so you just kind of incorporate it. I think that's the, probably the best way to do it. Excellent. That sounds really great. And I, a great point that you put there at the end, Lars, that incorporate your personality into what you're presenting because if it is too sterile, then people won't understand how to deal with it if it fails at their end as well. So keep your mistakes in. But you know, if something really goes terribly wrong, that's where you probably want to look at what kind of fallbacks do you have there. Anyway, we're out of time with um, the two of you. I want to thank you both for coming on. Uh, it's been a great pleasure talking to the two of you and learning from your experience as online content producers. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of Microsoft Build. And thank you for coming on and uh, check out for any questions that come up on the, the Twitters uh, to you. So yeah, thank you and we'll, uh, we'll see you around. Thanks, Aaron. Bye.